Support for The Nocturnist comes from the California Medical Association. At The Nocturnist, we are careful to ensure that all stories comply with healthcare privacy laws. Details may have been changed to ensure patient confidentiality. All views expressed are those of the person speaking and not their employer. You're listening to The Nocturnist Conversations. I'm Emily Silverman. In medicine, we usually think of diseases as abnormal. ALS, MS, Crohn's disease, breast cancer. These are all pathologies that need to be fixed, cured, or at least managed over time. But today's guest, Dr. Gabor Mate, argues that these diseases are actually a normal and even expected response to the highly abnormal way that we live our lives. Yes, we all come to the table with a different genetic endowment, but more than our genetics, Gabor argues, chronic disease is driven by the way we eat, work, interact with each other or don't, the way that we were raised and treated by our parents, and perhaps most profoundly, the way that we relate to ourselves. Gabor elucidates this argument in his latest book, which he co-wrote with his son, Daniel Mate. It's called The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. You may have already heard of Gabor Mate. He's a tremendous figure in the medical world, a renowned speaker, best-selling author, highly sought after person for his expertise on a range of topics, including childhood development, stress, and addiction. He's written several best-selling books, including the award-winning In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, and has co-authored a book called Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. And his works have been published internationally in nearly 30 languages. Reading Gabor's latest book really prompted me to think about the mind-body connection and the way that our souls and ourselves are intimately bound up with the neurohormonal immunological apparatus in the body. At the end of the book, Gabor offers a way to think about healing that I thought was really beautiful and actually offers a lot of hope for those of us dealing with chronic disease. But before our chat, I asked Gabor to read an excerpt from his book, The Myth of Normal. Here is Gabor Mate. For better or worse, we humans have a genius for getting used to things, especially when the changes are incremental. The newfangled word to normalize refers to the mechanism by which something previously aberrant becomes normal enough that it passes beneath our radar. On a society level, then, normal often means nothing to see here. All systems are functioning as they should. No further inquiry is needed. The truth as I see it is quite different. The late David Foster Wallace, master wordsmith, author and essayist, once opened a commencement speech with a droll parable that well illustrates the trouble with normality. The story concerns two fish crossing aquatic paths with an elder of their species who greets them jovially. Morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over to the other and goes, what the hell is water? The point Wallace wanted to leave his audience pondering was, the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones hardest to see and talk about. He could have been articulating this book's thesis. Indeed, the lives and the deaths of individual human beings, their quality, and in many cases their duration, are intimately bound up with aspects of modern society that are hardest to see and talk about. Phenomena that are like water to fish, both too vast and too near to be appreciated. In other words, those features of daily life that appear to us now as normal are the ones crying out the loudest for our scrutiny. That's my central contention. My core intention, accordingly, is to offer a new way of seeing and talking about these phenomena, bringing them back from the background to the foreground, so we might more swiftly find their much-needed remedies. I will make the case that much of what passes for normal in our society is neither healthy nor natural, and that to meet modern society's criteria for normality is in many ways to conform to requirements 
that are profoundly abnormal in regard to our nature-given needs, we should to say unhealthy and harmful on the physiological, mental, and even spiritual levels. If we could begin to see much illness itself, not as a cruel twist of fate or some nefarious mystery, but rather than as an expected and therefore normal consequence of abnormal, unnatural circumstances, it would have revolutionary implications for how we approach everything health-related. The ailing bodies and minds among us would no longer be regarded as expressions of individual pathology, but as living alarms directing our attention towards where our society has gone askew, where our prevailing certainties and assumptions around health are in fact fictions. Seen clearly, that might also give us clues as to what it would take to reverse course and build a healthier world. Gabor, thank you so much for that reading. It's a pleasure to to be able to speak my words finally in public. You know, this is my first opportunity to read from it. I'm so honored. Thank you. So as I mentioned to you earlier, we are a podcast by healthcare for healthcare. And you are a physician. We have a lot of doctors and nurses listening And I always love to ask people about their path to medicine. So maybe just to start, could you tell us a bit how you ended up in the field of medicine? Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Hungary. My grandfather had been a physician in southern Slovakia. He died in Auschwitz. My aunt was a leading ophthalmologist in Hungary. She came back from Auschwitz weighing something like 80 pounds. And all my life, I had never had any idea but that I would be a physician. That was my absolute goal. When I speculate on why, I can think of healing being an important theme in my life, given the terrible beginnings of my existence. However, I took a detour because when I got to, came to Canada when I was 13 and I did high school here, Decades later, I discovered that I qualify for the diagnosis of ADHD, but at the time I didn't know, but that kept me from concentrating and focusing and working hard. And now, I love English and history, and those courses I could do by studying at the last minute. You can't do very well with calculus or organic chemistry studying at the last minute. So basically, I defaulted into an English degree and taught high school for three years, but my second year, I knew this wasn't me. and. Uh, One day I just woke up and that's it, I'm going back to school. And then I had to do a year of makeup science courses and then apply for medical school. It was the toughest work I've ever done. For some reason, I had to study calculus. And to get to med school, you have to get high marks. I got 95%. Three weeks later, I couldn't have told you what calculus was about. So I had the smarts, but I didn't quite have the scientific mindset. But I got in, got through, did well enough, and uh, ended up in family practice. I practiced family medicine for seven years. I was also medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital. And the last 12 years of my medical work, I worked with a highly addicted population in Vancouver's downtown east side. How did you come to start writing books? So I've always been a writer, and um, I was a columnist for the student newspaper as an undergraduate. Even after I started medical practice, I began to write opinion columns for major Canadian newspapers. And for six years, I wrote the medical column for the local newspaper and also for the national newspaper, the Globe and Mail. My ADD tendencies, however, kept me from ever fulfilling my ambition to write a book. I had a patient of mine who was a very well-known Canadian poet. His first name was Warren. And one day I said to him, Warren, I want to write, but I don't know what. And he said, Gabor, you will write when you have something to teach the world. And that's exactly what happened. So in my mid-50s, when I stumbled into this diagnosis of ADHD, and right away I didn't buy into the existing 
dominant narrative as to what this is about. I never saw it as a genetic disease or a disease at all, genetic or otherwise. I had a different take on it. I knew I wanted to share this with the world. And that became my first book. You've written many books. So you mentioned the first book about ADD. You've also written books on stress and addiction. Tell us about your journey through these books and how did that journey lead you to this book? Well, let me begin with the ADD book. The Canadian title was Scattered Minds. I had this deep intuition that this condition is not a disease and it's not genetic, despite the fact that within a few months, two of my kids were diagnosed with it. But I knew something, which is that the tuning out, the absent-mindedness, which is the essence of ADD, is not a disease. It's a coping mechanism. And when I thought of my own infancy as a Jewish infant, spending my first year under Nazi occupation with a mother in terror for our lives, my father away in forced labor, her not knowing if he's dead or alive, my grandparents having been slaughtered in Auschwitz and the anti-Semitic laws and under the Nazis. What kind of state would my mother have been in? And infants are exquisitely sensitive to the emotional states of their parents. They absorb them. Now, how do I deal with all that stress? I can't escape, I can't change the situation, therefore the, the nervous system in the brain goes to the default disconnection mode, tuning out. But when is this happening? This is happening when the brain is developing. And when I looked at the epidemic of ADHD, the rising numbers, that alone tells you that it can't be genetic because genes don't change in a population over 10 or 20 or 30 years. So the medical truism that this is A, a disease of the brain, and B, is genetic, is nonsense. What it actually is, is a response to increasing stress in our culture. And you don't need conditions of war and genocide to stress little infants when their parents are stressed. So that became my first book. And uh, the second one then, when the body says no, that arose from my experience in family practice and also in palliative care. We see people before they get sick. And we see people in the context of their families. And so with that context, it just struck me that who got sick with chronic illness, and I'm talking about autoimmune disease, from scleroderma to lupus to rheumatoid arthritis to multiple sclerosis, colitis, Crohn's disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chronic migraines, neurological conditions like ALS or Parkinson's. It wasn't accidental. Now, what I have to tell you, nobody taught me this in medical school, but the point is certain features of personality, which mostly had to do with the emotional self-suppression, seem to be correlated with chronic medical illness of all kinds, from malignancy to autoimmune disease. Not to mention certain childhood experiences and personality traits. Now, what I didn't realize is that there's been a vast literature about this, published for a long time, literature that's utterly ignored in medical education. Let me give you one example. There was a Hungarian Jewish physician like me who taught at Harvard in the 1930s. His name was Soma Weiss. Weiss was so revered at Harvard that to this day, Harvard has a research day in his honor. And he gave a lecture to medical school class in 1939, I think, that in 1940 was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And Weiss said, I'm paraphrasing, but very accurately, that emotional factors play just as much a role in the causation of illness as physiological ones, and then what may be at least as important in the treatment of them. Now, since Weiss published this, there's been decades of scientific research showing the unity of mind and body, the inextricable oneness of the immune system with the emotional apparatus, the nervous system, the gut, psychoneurology in a nutshell, tens of thousands of papers. Not a word of it is breathed about in medical education, as far as I can tell to this day in most medical schools. Anyway, I began to notice these patterns myself. That was my second book, When the Body Says No. And my contention was when people don't know how to say no to the stresses in their lives, to the demands of the world, the body will say it in the form of illness. And I get emails from all over the world, people saying, oh my God, 
you describe my life. I can tell you about a rheumatologist at UCLA who I interviewed for this new book. She read my book, When the Body Says No, and began to see the same patterns and began to apply the lessons of it. She says now she's so much more successful in treating her clients, and many of them are off medications, but she dare not talk about it with her colleagues because she'd be laughed out of the profession. This is three years ago. So that's when the body says no. Do you want me to go on about my next book? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we could do a whole interview about each book. And I guess the reason I asked the question is this book, the new book, The Myth of Normal, it's taking on such a massive topic. And so I was curious about how you finally arrived at this, where you're putting your attention on the water we swim in, as you read in the intro, focusing on the culture. How did you arrive there? I didn't know this, but in 1977, George Engel, an American physician and psychiatrist, came up with this concept of biopsychosocial medicine. And he said that the problem of modern medicine is that we separate the mind from the body and we separate the individual from the environment. But clearly that's not possible. Not in real life, not in science either. So that if the mind and body unity is accurate, then it's also clear that we're affected by other bodies and in our relationship with other people. And so my friend and mentor, Dan Siegel, talks about interpersonal neurobiology that our nervous system and brains are in contact with and influenced by and influence other brains and other nervous systems. Well, if that's true, I take that a step further. So to give a simple example, we've known for decades that the more stressed parents are, the more likely a child is to develop asthma. It's also been shown that the more episodes of racism a black American woman experiences, the greater her risk for asthma. Now, I'm going to ask you and your audience a skill testing question. How do we treat asthma? With stress. <laughs> With stress hormones. We treat them with adrenaline or cortisol or their analogs. Should it maybe not occur to us that maybe stress, including social stress, has something to do with inflammation and the constriction of the bronchi and the bronchioles? In fact, if you go through medicine, What's the commonest medicine we use across inflammation of the gut, the nervous system, the skin, the integument, the connective tissue, the joints, steroid stress hormones? Is it not a reasonable question to ask ourselves what impact does life have on our stress response mechanisms? So it's just clear that if the mind and body are inseparable, which they are, then our social relationships are also part of the equation which by necessity means that so is the culture in general because we're all creatures of the culture that we grow up in. Literally, creations of the culture that we live in, which acts upon our genetic endowment, of course. And I tell you that in the last 10 years or 11 years, I collected 25,000 different articles, medical journal reports, scientific papers, newspaper reports, and so on, filed them all. I had this idea of writing the book, and at some point I had a contract to do it about five years ago, and I said, I can't do it, it's too big for me. It's just, this is more than I can chew. And I gave it up and I gave the money back to the publisher. And that's partly because I was living such a stressed life. To encapsulate how stressed it was, my wife said to me not that long ago, my friend, you've written a book called When the Body Says No, not write one called When the Wife Says No because I'm not living like this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle of all that stress, how could I have created this work? And it was in San Francisco, oddly enough, that I was sitting there four years ago this February, having come from holiday, having some space in my head. I was sitting in a hotel restaurant having breakfast with my wife, Ray, and this myth of normal just popped into my head. And I revisioned the book. Within two months, I had a major New York agent who had taken me on as a client and never had that before. And within eight months, I had a book contract. Then it took two and a half years of really hard work during which, believe me, my blood pressure is usually 110 over 65. 
my blood pressure was in 170 over 110 some days. I've panicked so much. I put so much stress on myself writing this book. <laughs> I was so desperate. I actually talked to a therapist and she really helped me to disidentify from the book that I'm doing the book, but I'm not the book. And how the book goes is not how I need to go. And my son, Daniel, who helped me write the book, was a wonderful support as well. I could not have done it without him. Two and a half years of writing. The book is 500 pages long to read, plus 70 pages of end notes and scientific references and index. Our first draft was double this length. That's so much I wanted to say. And I didn't know what not to say. So it took another year to trim it down and to rewrite it. And I'm very happy with it now, but it was a long, arduous process. And here it is. So I love this story of you sitting in the restaurant in San Francisco of all places and the title comes to you, mm -hmm. The Myth of Normal. So what do you mean by the myth of normal? What myth? So in medicine, we use the word normal very legitimately. There's a normal range outside the limits of which our physiology just can't sustain itself. Body temperature or blood pH, our bodies can't sustain life. So that's a legitimate use of the word normal. But in our society, we've come to confound that sense of normal with what the norm is in this culture. We think that what is normal is also healthy and natural, or at least inevitable. And that's the myth of normal, that the way we're living right now, it's like if you wanted to study zebras, where would you study them? In a zoo or out there on the savanna? And studying human beings in this society is like studying animals in a zoo who don't know that they're in a zoo. They're like the fish in the water, number one. Number two, the other implication is that what we call abnormality, like mental illness, or what we call mental illness, or much of physical illness, are actually normal responses to abnormal circumstances. So the myth is that these people or these conditions are abnormal. They're not. The ADD tuning out is not abnormal. It's a normal response to the stress that many children are under these days. So those are the two senses in which I employ to use the myth of normal. And this analogy of the zoo. So studying humans today is like studying them in a zoo, but they don't know that they're in a zoo. And in the book, you have chapters for different aspects of things. So you have a chapter about politics and economics and unfettered capitalism and what that does to us. You have stuff about climate. You have stuff about all sorts of aspects of society. I can see why your initial impulse was to return your book <laughs> advance and say, no, 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 this is too big. Yeah. So I guess the question is, can you lay out as simply as possible to our audience, like what is the zoo? Is it modernity? Can it be encapsulated in a single word or diagnosed in a way that gets at some root? Or is it more just a conglomeration of these economic and political and social and cultural forces? I do think it can be expressed fairly simply. How we evolved as human beings was over millions of years and even our own species, which has trod the earth for about 150 to 200,000 years. For most of our existence, we lived out there in nature in small band hunter-gatherer groups, which is what the wonderful psychologist Darcia Narvez from Notre Dame calls the evolved nest. And the evolved nest involved our relationship to nature and our relationship to each other where children grew up in the context of multiple adult relationships. If you study Aboriginal groups here in North America or elsewhere, they held their children, they didn't put them down to let them cry it out. In fact, a Cree woman told me in Canada that in our nation, she said, 
children weren't even allowed to touch the ground for two years because we just held them all the time, you know? So this is the evolved nest. It involved a context of safe, supportive, secure attachments. Now, human beings are incredibly adaptive. We can adapt to all kinds of different environments, but that doesn't mean we'll do our best at all these different environments. There are basic human needs that if you meet them, you're gonna get a certain line of development, but if you don't meet them, you're gonna get distorted lines of development. The change happened with the onset of civilization 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, but it's been accelerating and accelerating and accelerating throughout history. And globalized capitalism represents the highest departure from the evolved nest in every way, which is atomization, aggressive competition, setting people against each other, making people economically insecure, setting racial groups against each other. All these things go against our essential needs as human beings. And this includes how we gestate children, how we birth children, how we raise them, how we educate them, and then on the stresses that society imposes on people. This is in the richest societies in the world, how insecure and lost people are. This is so far away from the evolved nest that you couldn't get any further. Why did this happen? We're animals. Other animals don't go off and build cities out of concrete and glass. They don't open businesses. They don't create legal systems. And they don't write Shakespeare. They don't develop the concept of human rights. There's so many things about civilization that are horrible, but also so many things that can be beautiful. We have evolved to develop this like cerebral cortex that can think and that can abstract itself and create these things. So why did that happen? Why didn't we just use our cerebral cortex to stay in hunter-gatherer tribes and carry our children for two years and just keep things how they were? It's also evolution. I'm not putting down progress or civilization. I'm not suggesting that we destroy our cities and I'm not engaged in such juvenile fantasies. And we have evolved. We have developed intellectual capacities or creative capacities. It's amazing what human beings have achieved, just as you suggest, in science, in medicine, in art, in, in self-understanding even. Now, if you ask me, well, how did that happen? I think that's a big mystery. I mean, I'd be presumptuous to explain to you human development, but what happened was that as we began to use the intellect, we also unconsciously gave the intellect primacy over our emotional lives. Now, when you look at phylogeny or ontogeny, both the emotional systems develop before the intellectual ones. And they're never meant to be overridden by the intellect. They're meant to help use the intellect for the benefit of the organism. And I'm not the first one to say so, but the intellect has been used now against the organism itself. Now, when you combine that with the rise of different classes and with different levels of power and influence and wealth, now you have people who can use the intellect and all the technology that's available for their own purposes, even to the detriment of the majority. Doctors could probably get on board with the idea that stress causes illness. And I think most doctors would even agree that certain diseases can be, quote, psychosomatic, although this is often distinguished from, quote, real or, quote, organic illness. It's almost like in its separate category. But in your book, you're arguing for something deeper, which is that almost all illness, I mean, not all, but you know, not like infectious diseases and things like that, but everything from diseases like ALS, as you mentioned, 
multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, autoimmune diseases, especially in women, certain instances of cancer, that even those types of diseases that we traditionally as doctors view as, quote, real, that they stem from our emotional life. What I'm saying is what insightful physicians have been saying forever. James Paget of Paget's disease in the 1900s talked about the relationship of depressive emotions and breast cancer. He says it's undeniable. And we have studies now to show if at the time of diagnosis a woman is depressed, her chances of survival are less. But he said this about 150 years ago. In the 19th century, Sir William Osler, one of the founding physicians at Johns Hopkins and the Canadian medical icon, he talked about rheumatoid arthritis as stress-driven. Jean-Martin Charcot, the great neurologist, the father of modern neurology, who um, first described multiple sclerosis, said this is a disease driven by stress. George Engel, who in 1977 talked about biopsychosocial medicine. Rudolf Virchow, the German physician, the father of modern pathology, he said that politics is just medicine on a broader scale. He said this after investigating the typhus epidemic in northern Germany and Silesia, now part of Poland. So these insights have been with us forever. The difference is we now have the science to prove it. So when you talk about psychosomatic, I say all diseases are psychosomatic in the truest sense of the word, not in the sense of imagined, it's all in your head kind of dismissal, but in the sense that the psyche and the soma, the body, are inseparable. So when something happens in one area, given the unity of it all, it's going to have an impact. Now let's just look at healthy anger for a moment. What is the role of healthy anger? Why do all mammals have anger circuits in their brain? We share that with other animals, by the way. Because it's boundary protection. It basically says, you're in my space, get out. It's a boundary defense. Now, if we ask ourselves, what is the role of the emotional system in general? I don't think I'm being controversial when I say that the role of emotions is to keep out what is not healthy and welcome and to allow in what's nurturing. Let me ask you a trick question then. What's the role of the immune system? It's the same, to keep out what's dangerous and keep in what's safe. Exactly. Now, given that physiologically this is one system, as psychoneuroimmunology, or if you want to give it its fancy name, psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology has amply and elegantly demonstrated, when you're repressing the one, you're affecting the other. And the repression of anger has been shown to depress the activity of natural killer cells. For example, how do you explain the epidemiological studies that show that men who are sexually abused in childhood have tripled the rate of myocardial infarctions regardless of whether they smoke or drink? Because trauma causes inflammation, which you can measure in the body. As I travel around the world, audiences of hundreds, and I'll say, well, how many of you have been to a neurologist rheumatologist, cardiologist, gastroenterologist, immunologist, dermatologist, any kind of anologist in the last five years. A lot of people will put their hands up. And I'll say, keep your hand up if they ask you about any childhood trauma. Keep your hand up if they ask you about how you feel about yourself as a human being, whether you like yourself or not. Keep your hand up if they ask you about your primary relationships. Keep your hand up if they ask you about how you feel about your work and what their work environment is like. As I say in this book, the number of hands that stay up could be counted on the fingers of one hand. So you might be vaguely or theoretically aware of the relationship of stress and illness. In practice, we utterly ignore it to the detriment of our clients, because as I also show in this book, and if other people have documented, paying attention to those questions can actually lead to significant remission of illnesses. Music 
early childhood trauma and you gave examples like, you know, horrific examples like sexual abuse and things of that nature. You speak of your own personal story with the Holocaust, also horrific. But you also say in the book that it doesn't have to be capital T trauma, that there's also this small T trauma. And that sometimes when you ask people about their childhood, they'll say, oh, I had a happy childhood. Or they'll say, oh, I actually don't remember that much about my childhood. But that there are things hidden in there, in this small T trauma that can also lead to disease. So maybe tell us a little bit about the small T trauma and what that might look like and how that affects us. So you have to then understand what I mean when I use the word trauma. And I go back to its Greek word origin. It means a wound. So trauma is a psychological wound. But the essence of trauma is what I alluded to before, which is the disconnection from self. You never met a one-day-old baby that's disconnected from themselves. You never met a one-day-old baby that represses their emotions. She's lying there wet and hungry and lonely. And she's saying to herself, oh gosh, I'm wet, hungry and lonely, but mom and dad have been working so hard, I better not bother them, so I'm going to just be quiet. I mean, have you met a one-day-old baby that'll do that? No, will you ever? So that repression that happens is a response to life experience. Now, people can be wounded or hurt in two ways. One is by bad things happening to them, war, as we see all over the world, abuse of children, which happens far more frequently than doctors tend to know because they don't ask those questions. But I know that in California, Nadine Burke Harris, your Surgeon General, is now introducing the questionnaire about adverse childhood experiences into the evaluation of children in public health clinics. I think I got that right. So that's the growing awareness. So you can hurt people by bad things happening to them, but you can also hurt little kids not by doing bad things to them, but by not meeting their needs. Now, human children have evolution determined certain, what I call irreducible needs. Irreducible needs being, if you don't meet them, there's going to be suffering. Well, we have an irreducible need for water. If you don't, you don't have to hurt somebody, just deprive them of water, see what will happen to them. Well, people have also been that we are emotional creatures with a sophisticated limbic system. Our emotional needs are also important for our development. And in this society, those irreducible emotional needs of children, which I could outline if you like, but I'll just mention them now, they're often not met. Not because parents don't love their kids, not because they don't do their best, but because of the stresses of this culture and the very, I would say, anti-child parenting advice that a lot of parents get from so-called parenting experts which undermine the attachment relationship and try to emphasize behavioral control, which is toxic to the child. These are from loving, well-meaning parents. Then there's a lot of us, like myself and my wife, who our kids weren't abused, but they were raised by two parents who were carrying their traumas that they hadn't worked through yet. By the time they became young parents, we passed our traumas onto the kids unwittingly for all the love that we had. So children can be hurt in many ways, and that's what I mean by the small T trauma. And now, one of the effects of small T trauma is the child gets the sense that they're just not acceptable with all their emotions. Well, let me give you an example of small T trauma, okay? Let me tell you a story. A four-year-old girl runs into the house because she's being bullied by neighborhood children. Four-year-old little girl. And she runs to her mummy seeking protection and support. And the mother says, there's no room for cards in this house. Now you get out and deal with those kids. How would you perceive that as a physician, as a mother, as a human being? How would you perceive that interaction? As incredibly stressful. (laughs) It would make me feel alone and like I have to fend for myself. Yeah. That was Hillary Clinton who told that story at the Democratic Convention as an example of resilience building, mothering. In fact, it was the relation of a child being traumatized in front of millions of people and nobody even bothered an eyelash. That's how normalized small T trauma has become in our culture. I've been thinking about these ideas, which intuitively I agree with, and wondering to myself, why does Western medicine and why do doctors 
ignore this and ignore the evidence and so on and so forth. And I was thinking about myself and I was thinking about like, if I, let's say in 10 years, I get diagnosed with breast cancer, God forbid, I would wonder to myself, and you, you talk about this a bit in your book, but for the audience, like if I would blame myself, if I would say, oh, clearly I had all this trauma and I just didn't work through it in time. And it's my failure to address all my wounds. And now I have breast cancer. If we're talking about things like breast cancer and MS and diseases like this as stemming from trauma that's not been dealt with, do you ever worry about how that narrative might show up for people when they get sick and then in thinking to themselves like, oh, I should have been able to get under this in time and now that I'm sick, like it's just another failure. Like, do you ever worry about that or how do you think about that? Because I can see that being a barrier to people really taking up this worldview. It's an essential issue that you're raising, and it's very important that if we are to talk about these things, we have to do it very sensitively. Now, in each of my book, I spend pages explaining why blame is unscientific, inappropriate, and cruel. You can't, on the one hand, scientifically point out the importance of the early environment and not talk about parents. We have to recognize the context in which parents are parenting their kids. So there's no question of blaming individual parents here. As far as the individual blaming themselves, I mean, if I came to you with my ADD, and if you understood that this was a coping mechanism that I adopted as an 11-month-old, would you ever blame me for tuning out? There's no room for blame here. There's just understanding is the point. So when people adopt these dynamics unconsciously early in life, Why would I blame them? I was in my late 40s before I even realized that I'd ever been traumatized. (laughs) So is the idea that a book like this might help people realize these things sooner in life so that they can get ahead of them? Let me come back to your hypothetical example of you developing breast cancer, okay? Now... We often dismiss that as a genetic disease, but in fact, as you're probably aware, out of 100 women with carcinoma of the breast, only seven have the genes. And by the way, out of 100 women with the genes, not all of them will develop breast cancer, although they have a much higher risk, no question. If I was your physician, if you came to me with breast cancer, what would you rather hear? You've got this mysterious condition that we don't know why the heck you got it. You've led a healthy life, you've exercised, you had the right diet, but here we are with breast cancer, too bad. Or would you rather hear, there may be factors that you're not aware of that have to do with your childhood experience and certain way you relate to yourself, that if you reverse them, they could have a positive effect on your illness, which is documentably the case in multiple sclerosis, in rheumatoid arthritis, and in cancer. Which would you rather hear? Which is the more compassionate, but also more scientific, and more hopeful message. And I'm telling you, I've had so many people with breast cancer just thank me for the work. So there's a chapter in the book called Disease as Teacher. That I don't recommend that way of learning, but when disease shows up, when people undertake not just the medical treatment, which as a physician I can only support and marvel at, but at the same time, looked at this other side of the coin. We had actually given them a better chance. Now, I don't know if you know this. Well, you did because you read the book, but there are even documented cases of ALS that reversed themselves. Now, they don't know why, but I think I know why. And there's some indication that the more angry they get in touch with, the better their prognosis becomes. Now, would you rather hear that or not hear it? And there's no blame involved there, no blame whatsoever. By the way, just so that we can humble ourselves a little bit as physicians and healthcare givers, Stephen Hawking, the physicist, was diagnosed with ALS at age 20 and given two years to live. And he died as the world's greatest living physicist, or one of the ones, 55 years later. Maybe there's some things we don't know. And what's interesting is these patients, when they get better, that doctors never ask, what did you do? The most they will say is, what are you doing? Just keep doing it. But they never ask, what is it that you did do? 
I don't know if you relate to this, but first of all, who goes into medicine in the first place? Speaking of myself, a very driven individual who really wants to be important. Why did I want to be important? I'm compensating for something. Now, if you want to be important, for God's sake, go to medical school. If you want to be wanted, go to medical school. You'll be wanted all the time, number one. Number two, what is it that we put up with to get to medical school? For a lot of people, medical school is a traumatizing experience. Sleep deprivation, emotional deprivation, healthy food deprivation, subjected to authority and leaders in a highly stressed environment when you're being shamed, not infrequently. No wonder that the cellular clocks of our bodies, the telomeres, they fray faster in medical students than in other people their age. And then nothing in our education prepares us to even know about these things. How would we recognize all this stuff? It's funny that you mentioned shame because we're actually on the verge of releasing an entire series on shame in medicine. So I'm hoping that that will help bring some of this into the light. But as we approach the end of the interview, I want to make sure that we talk about healing. You mentioned some of these examples of cases of spontaneous remission. And, you know, these are extreme examples, fascinating examples, but definitely extreme you offer a definition for healing and you talk about healing as returning to wholeness. And you say, any movement toward wholeness begins with the acknowledgement of our own suffering and of the suffering of the world. This doesn't mean getting caught in a never ending vortex of pain, melancholy, and especially victimhood. As mentioned earlier, a new and rigid identity founded on trauma or for that matter, healing can be its own kind of trap. True healing simply means opening ourselves to the truth of our lives, past and present, as plainly and objectively as we can. We acknowledge where we were wounded, and as we are able, perform an honest audit of the impacts of those injuries as they have touched both our own lives and those of others around us. Tell us more about this idea of healing as returning to wholeness, because that is not a definition I learned in medical school. And I think it's really beautiful. Well, first of all, let me just quickly, parenthetically say that what we call spontaneous healing is nothing spontaneous about it. That we call it spontaneous is simply our lack of awareness of the dynamics of healing. And when I talked to Jeff Rediger of Harvard, we both agreed that the biggest change in a person's relationship to themselves, which is to say their return to themselves. Now, when you say healing uh, definition about wholeness, did you know that the word healing originates in an Anglo-Saxon phrase for wholeness? That's the word origin. And I'm Hungarian, and literally, the word to be healthy is to be whole. Literally, the same words for both concepts. So language has always carried the imprints of ancient wisdom that we've become alienated from. So if trauma is the disconnection from self, which is the essential traumatic dynamic, then the healing is the return to our, ourselves, which is to be in touch with our bodies, our emotions, and our needs. And as my friend uh, Lisa Rankin points out, it's not the same as cure. You can get cure without healing, and sometimes you get healing without cure, and sometimes you get both. But the healing is that return to the self. Now, in practice, when we heal, there's very often demonstrable benefits to our physiological states. I know people with multiple sclerosis who once they understand how they unconsciously stress themselves and they stop doing it, their diseases stop progressing or even remits and they're off their medications. I have a woman in the book who talks about these beautiful conversations I have with my rheumatoid arthritis. She's off all her medications. Typically traumatized person, self-repressed, until the disease woke her up. So that's what I mean by healing, and no, those examples I give are extreme, and I by no means do I pretend that I think everybody can do it, or that it would work for everybody. I myself don't know if I could engage in that kind of deep, self-transformation that these people have manifested. It just shows you what's possible, that's all. But I know lots of people 
whether with mental health conditions, as I outline in the book, or addictions, or what we call physical illnesses and so on, who have had significant impact on their health by engaging in this journey of healing, and on which I spend more chapters, by the way, than I do in outlining the problem, which surprised me, because I thought when I was writing the book, yeah, I can diagnose and I can describe the problem, but what am I going to say about healing? In fact, it was all there inside me. I just had to ask myself, what do I already know? What have I already learned from all the people I've worked with? What have I learned about my own healing? What have I seen in the world? And these eight chapters on healing just generated themselves. You talk about the four A's, authenticity, agency, anger, acceptance, and then there's two bonus A's, which focus not so much on the level of the individual or the relationship, but society. So you talk about activism and advocacy. How did you arrive at these A's? These four A's represent kind of a distillation. So agency, meaning who's in charge of my life, whose life is this? Now we're programmed in a society to live in other people's minds, our image, what they think of us, what we look like to them, number one. And, you know, to please other people and so on. Anger, healthy anger, we already talked about. Its role is a natural boundary defense. That's as distinct from rage, which is sort of incohate, triggered volcanic eruptions, which also threaten health. In the aftermath of a rage episode, your risk for a stroke or a heart attack doubles for the next two hours, documentably. I'm talking about healthy anger, which I explain more in detail in the book. Acceptance, which means just a non-sugar-coated acceptance of how things are right now. Acceptance doesn't mean toleration. Acceptance doesn't mean that I have to like that it is how it is. Acceptance means that I see how it is. And I'm going to accept how I am here at the moment. And I'm going to be curious about it. And talking of shame, you mentioned the four A's. What was the fourth one? Uh, authenticity. authenticity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who could forget authenticity? So authenticity is this connection with ourselves of knowing who we are, knowing which of our emotions belong in the present moment and which is triggered from the past of not rejecting any emotion that arises for us, not necessarily acting it out either, but not rejecting it, not repressing it, not making ourselves wrong for it, and of saying no when a no needs to be said, or for that matter, saying a yes when a yes needs to be said, because so many people suffer not only because they don't know how to say no, but also because they have deep urges and desires and passions that in this stress society they don't say yes to. So authenticity comes down to the knowing when to say yes and when to say no. And that shows up in our work, in our creativity, in our personal lives. And by the way, how old is your child? She's just over eight months. Terrific. What word do you think she'll start using around one and a half? Mommy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she'll say mommy, daddy. But there's another word that you'll hear all the time. It's going to be no. Time to put your shoes on. No. Why does nature do that? Why doesn't the kid say, yes, I'd love to put my, you know, because we have, <laughs> be, because we have to develop our own will and we have to know to say no before a yes doesn't mean anything. Now in this deranged culture, we call that the terrible twos. There's nothing terrible about it. We make it terrible because we think that it means that we're failing as parents. But the child's no is the little wall behind which she develops her own little will. So authenticity means that authentic yes and no. So Gabor, if you could give a message to the healthcare workers in the audience, what would it be? It would be that all of us have entered this field with a mix of unconscious and conscious motives, but surely the calling in it is the potential for our work to provide healing to a very troubled and aching and suffering world. And in order to do that clearly and efficiently and compassionately and in a way that fulfills us, we have to be aware of everything that goes into creating health or ill health. And our education has not prepared for us for it, which makes the work much more frustrating and much more disillusioning than it needs to be. So that 
there's a possibility of us working more true to ourselves, even in the face of a system that often doesn't get it. I have been speaking to the wonderful Gabor Mate about his book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Gabor, thank you so much for being here today. Well, what a pleasure this conversation has been. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Nocturnus Conversations. Next week, I'll be speaking with physician and visual artist Matthew Wetchler. This episode of the Nocturnus Conversations was produced by Carly Besser and John Oliver and edited and mixed by John Oliver. Our executive producer is Ali Block and our chief operating officer is Rebecca Groves. Our original theme music was composed by Yosef Monroe and any additional music is from Blue Dot Sessions. The Nocturnus is made possible by the California Medical Association, a physician-led organization that works tirelessly to make sure that the doctor-patient relationship remains at the center of medicine. To learn more about the CMA, visit cmadocs.org. Our show is also made possible with donations from listeners like you. Thank you so much for supporting our work in storytelling. If you enjoy the show, please help others find us by giving us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. To contribute your voice to an upcoming project or to make a donation, visit our website at thenocturnist.com. I'm your host, Emily Silverman. See you next time.